Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Hall from Exodus and formerly from Slayer, and you're listening to The Razor's Edge. What's going on, guys? It's Tom here with Mike from Devil Driver. How are you, sir? Are you well? I am well. How are you? Good. Yeah, yeah, not too bad, man. Not too bad. Uh, I'm all good. I just want to, uh, before we get started, just wish Des a massive fucking happy birthday to begin with. What a what a day to happy birthday when the brand new album has just been released. <laughs> Des's birthday and finally got the rest of dealing with demons out today. Today's a good day. Today is going to be a great day. But what, before we get onto the album, we'll head, we'll go back a little bit. So obviously. How was your pandemic season? I know it's kind of disappeared now. It's not really a thing anymore. But I know, obviously, Des suffered quite a bit uh, during. So, like, But for you personally, how was it for you? You know, I was one of the lucky ones. I'm very, very fortunate to um, say the pandemic didn't really affect me a whole lot. You know, and um, <laughs> I guess in some ways I kind of welcomed it because it gave me a, a much needed break from touring. <laughs> you know, I've pretty much been spending six to nine months out on the road since 2004 with the band, you know, with little breaks here and there for if we weren't on the road, we we're, you know, working on music, recording and uh, gave me some time to spend time with more time with my family that I had missed out on. You know, I've got uh, three nephews and two nieces that, you know, for the most part, I kind of miss them growing up. And, you know, unfortunately, two of them are at, in college now. So they they moved away. But I got to get some time in there before before they left. And you know, sleeping in my own bed, being able to go surf all the time whenever I want. You know, I got engaged, you know, just, uh, you know, got involved with more real life stuff. And uh, it's been nice. But. After three and a half years of not touring, I really was excited to get back out on the road and find out if I still enjoyed it or not. And yeah. the second I got on that bus, I knew it, it felt right. And, <laughs> you know, I like being around my friends. It's, you know, we're very happy, uh, happy camp. And we, we enjoy being around each other and it's fun. I think it goes to show, though, now you're 10 albums deep. That you know, it's it's clear that the chemistry with you guys is is second to none. It's incredible. Yeah, and even with the guys that have uh, come and gone, you know, like Austin, Neil, I'm still two of my best friends. Uh, me, Jeff Kendrick, John Miller, and John Berklin have a WhatsApp thread on our a group chat oh. on our phones, and <laughs> never there's never you know we usually text each other. I would say at least once a week or so. You know, we're we all keep in touch. We're all good friends, and uh, everything's remains friendly. That's amazing. I know you just love to hear stuff like that. And obviously, like you say, with the pandemic, that you actually got time to go. Oh my days! I can actually just kick back a bit and actually, you know, enjoy life a little. You know, actually, you know, you say that you missed out on your nieces and nephews growing up, which is, you know. It's rubbish in a way, but you were you were living your best life and touring and doing that sort of stuff. So it's kind of like a massive catch twenty two. It is, and you know, luckily I still had ways to make money outside of Double Driver, and so I didn't really have to. You know, luckily I didn't have to do the unemployment thing or yeah, <laughs> you know, deal with that kind of that kind of stuff. I mean, I had friends that were you know in the music scene that didn't have the options that i have afforded to me and um god one of my friends i think he spent he was trying to figure out his unemployment situation and i think he spent over 12 hours on hold one day no (laughs) way yeah it's uh i hear stories like that all the time he just Basically on hold the the whole time, you know, trying to uh, get some kind of relief money from the state, and you know, I'm so grateful that I didn't have to go through through all that. And um, you know, yeah, I feel very fortunate. It's it's such a 
crazy. It's weird ago. That was three years ago. Now that started. It's like it's so crazy how it's just like come and gone. It doesn't seem yeah. like three years. It really doesn't. <laughs> you know, time has definitely flown by, but I'm glad it's over. Yeah. And I'm glad that we waited to get back out on the road where we don't really have to worry about it. I really didn't worry about it on the last on the last run because I got COVID a second time, maybe like a month or two before we left. And I was like, good. I got the antibodies. I don't really have to worry about getting sick <laughs> and then being the one that gets sick and spreads it out through the entire bus and that oh. whole situation. And luckily nobody got sick. Unfortunately, Des did get COVID the day we got home from the last tour. And it wasn't, you know, the second time you get it is usually a walk in the park compared to the first. It was for me. But uh, um, that's part of the reason why we decided not to do meet and greets on this last tour is, you know, everyone was asking me why. And it's, you know, I was I was concerned about Dez's health and yeah. possibly getting COVID again and the tour getting cut short. And it's just like, let's, you know, let's not go out there and, you know, be afraid about it but let's just go out there and just you know be a little extra careful just to make you know making sure the first time we go back out again is a success and it really was you know having davir and alex in the band his was just awesome um i had toured with both of them davir was tekken for um dope on the last static x run and we toured with alex um many years ago with uh when holy grail was opening up for us, which is the reason why I picked him to be in the band. We only tried out two people, and um, when he sent me his audition video, I was probably about 10 seconds in, I was like, yeah, this is going to be the guy. (laughs) And our first show back in Arizona, I kind of look over to my right to see how he's doing, and he's just looks like he was having so much fun, and his hair is just going all over the place, and and I could I could hear him in my monitors, and he's just playing everything perfectly. I was just like, oh, thank God. You, know, <laughs> I, you, you never know what you're what to expect when you get somebody out on the road. It, things can go really bad, and luckily that's never happened with us. You know, we've always had solid road dogs in the band that really enjoy the lifestyle, and uh, Alex and Davier fit right in. And then obviously having Miller back in the band, I, I was 99% sure he was just going to have the greatest time of his life on this run after being out of the band for 13 years, I think. And uh, he did. And I just love having him back in the band. Yeah, it's incredible. Especially when he gets with, you know, with your best friends and stuff like that. And you, get, you know, they're just loving, living their best life. You know, you're not good to have to worry about him. I can just leave him be. Look, look at him. Look at him. Go, oh, look, look, look at him. <laughs> Uh, Miller and I have known each other since I think he was 19 and I was 18. We met in college and, you know, he was uh, he was kind of my gateway into Devil Driver, you know, out of the out of him, Jeff Kenrick and John Berklin. You know, he was the first one that I met and I started hanging out and he was the kind of like the guy that invited me into their circle of friends, you know, because I would walk from Santa Barbara City College to campus to my car through a neighborhood because parking in the the college parking lot was just impossible. So <laughs> my first day of college, I actually, you know, found a, a place in a neighborhood nearby where I could park and I would walk by where the three of those guys lived every day on the way to school. And Miller just saw me walking one day and was like, I bet that guy's into heavy metal. And <laughs> He, you know, he came up to me, invited me into the house and it just kind of came out like their house was like, the hub for you know anybody in in santa barbara that was part of a heavy metal band or was interested in heavy metal like we all kind of just congregated at their house and if i had time in between classes i'd be like well i'm I'm gonna go hang out with miller kendrick and berklin and see what they're up to and um that's basically how everything got started that's beautiful i mean you've i I was gonna get to that point of you know how how you guys actually, because you joined two years after Devil Driver was formed, is that correct? Yeah, they started, I mean, I think it was probably actually closer to three, because I believe the album came out in 2002, the the, uh, the self-titled, and, yeah. um, you know, they, they obviously spent at least a year getting things together, 
with the band before the album came out. So yeah, I would actually say it was closer to three years after they, you know, uh, started working on the album. But uh, yeah, that was a that was a fun time for me, life changing. I was there. Um, how did you actually? What actually made you want to be a musician in the first place? What made you go? You know what? This is this is the life for me. MTV. When I was yeah. a kid, um, I have two older siblings, or actually, I have three older siblings. But there's a there's a ten year gap between, um, you know, my my oldest brother. And then I have a sister that's about three years younger than him. And then I have another brother, but he's 10 years younger than my sister. And then there's me. So I'm the youngest. And my oldest siblings, Chris and Jill, they were teenagers in the 80s. And when MTV was, you know, really popping, they were just playing music videos. So they always had it on and I always heard, you know, 80s music like Depeche Mode, The Cure, um, Tears for Fears, Susie and the Banshees, you know, things like that just coming from out of their bedrooms that were not too far away from my bedroom. And I didn't really get into 80s music until I got into college. When I got into college, I really started getting into, um, like, you know, mainly Depeche Mode and Susie and the Banshees and, you know, the darker side of 80s pop. <laughs> And, um, but so I think subconsciously they were kind of feeding me the ingredients into wanting to be a musician even before I knew it. But when I saw Def Leppard on MTV for the first time, th that was it. You know, I saw Pour Some Sugar on Me and, oh. um, which believe it or not is w not one of my favorite songs on the, on that record. But, um, I got Hysteria, absolutely love it, still love it to this day. And, you know, started going back in time with Def Leppard and got high and dry and Pyromania on through the night is OK, but mainly Pyromania and high and dry. Those are my jams. <laughs> I, I just I think those albums are so underrated. Um, compared to Hysteria and anything else that Def Leppard has done since. But I was also, you know, I got into like the Scorpions and uh, Skid Row um, unfortunately, I don't know why I missed the train as as far as like Wasp and Rat and Quiet Riot. Like for some reason, those are three '80s bands that I've gotten into now, as opposed okay. to back in the day. I don't know why that missed. Me. I just went and saw Wasp for the first time uh, a few months ago, and it was so good. It was just an absolutely amazing show. But uh, that eventually led into getting into Metallica. And I basically grew up playing, you know, Metallica for the most part taught me how to play guitar. You know, I got the book for the Black Album and Master of Puppets and uh, Justice for All, Ride the Lightning. And I just learned as many songs as I could. Probably spent too much time learning Metallica when I probably should have been learning some other stuff, too. And then that eventually led me becoming a big Marilyn Manson fan in high school. And I started to get more, get more into industrial. Like uh, one of my brother's friends, we were driving. I had a very cool older brother. He would take me to parties with his friends and get me oh. drunk. And uh, <laughs> I don't think my parents really minded so much because they just wanted me and my brother to have a healthy relationship. Yeah. And uh, so we would, you know, I would go out and drink with them. And then one day his friend, Justin was driving me from party to party and it was just, just us. And he put on cam FDM's extort album. And I was just like, what is this? Like, Oh, this is called industrial music. I had never like, I mean, I had heard ministry and nine inch nails at that point, but I had never turned or heard the term uh, industrial before. And that just could, took me into to a completely different direction. And, it's still my favorite genre of music, industrial and 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 goth, but unfortunately there's just not that many good industrial bands out there. So I mostly stick to the stuff that was released in the 90s, which to me was just the the you know, the best time to get into that music because of like what Wax Tracks Records was doing in Chicago and just a lot of good industrial and goth came out in that time. 
Yeah, I, I grew up in the, the new metal era. So, like, I missed the boat on the 80 <laughs> stuff and that sort of thing. So I grew up with... Uh, my dad got me to, like, Nirvana. Um, Nine Inch Nails is also one of them as well. But, like, when I really peaked into rock and roll, it was, like, Lip Biscuit, Papa Roach, Linkin Park, that sort of thing. So I missed all that stuff in the 90s. Um, I do love Def Leppard, though. Great band. And my parents from the same city, so it's absolutely oh, yeah. incredible. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I love a bit of Def Leppard. Um, weirdly, I like the ballads more. I don't know why. It's like When Love and Hate Collide. I absolutely love that song. That's a newer song, too. Isn't that off yeah. of, uh, like, Adrenalize or something like that? Adrenalize, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah I don't know. I've, I've tried to get into their new stuff, but some of it's okay, but I really enjoy their older stuff better. You know, I, I really think, you know, uh, I don't know if it's 100% due to, to Steve Clark, but I think Steve Clark's influence was a big reason why I like Def Leppard so much from back in the yeah. day. No. Fair, absolutely. Um, I know you have seen, like we said, you joined Devil Driver about three years after they originated, but do you know where the names came from? Because I don't think of a band name as one of the hardest things to ever have to do in life. But do you know where the name originated? Yeah. I mean, the band was originally called Death Ride. Okay. And, and Dez had a hard time securing the trademark on that because there's a bicycle race in the States called Death Ride. Ugh. And, you know, honestly, I don't think it would be a problem securing the trademark if you really wanted to, because when you secure a trademark, uh, you have to specify what that trademark is going to be used for. You know, just because you own it on a bicycle race doesn't mean that you can own it for something, a different type of business, you know, such as a band. But I don't think it, it probably was a bad idea since the name was out there already and associated with something else other than a band. You know, who knows what a Google search well, yeah. <laughs> would, would yield for some fans like I thought the name of the band was Death Ride. Google it. Uh, No, that's a bicycle bicycle race. Move on. So I guess it was in the band's best interest to uh, find a different name. And I believe Dez's wife, Anastasia, was reading a book that had the term devil driver in it that referred to a bell that witches would use back in the day to drive away evil. That's awesome. I remember the guy that I replaced, Evan, you know, he and I were friends at the time and I had. You know, I'd been in a in a band with Berklin, Kendrick, and Miller very briefly before Devil Driver was even a thing. And, we, you know, the band broke up because our singer left, and Berklin was already working on Devil Driver with Dez, and he was just like, I don't, you know, I'm putting all my, my time into this. And I remember when Evan came up to me, and he was like, dude, we changed the name of the band from Death Ride to Devil Driver. And I was like, Devil Driver? I like that better. That's a much better name. 100%. And uh, so I'm kind of glad that Bicycle Race existed to <laughs> force us to change the name because I, I do like the way Devil Driver rolls off the tongue better than Death Ride. Absolutely. It just sounds so metal as well. It's just, it just rolls off the tongue so beautifully. <laughs> it, it does. <laughs> um. So... Lyric, I know Des probably gets is mainly mainly involved lyrics wise. Um, but do you know, are they are they pers- quite personal to him? Are they story based? Like, what are the lyrics based on mainly? I think he kind of goes both ways. Um, a lot of his lyrics are about you know, as I think a lot of people write lyrics about relationships that have gone sour, um, preservation, and uh, believing in yourself. You know, Des has always been a believer that if you really, if you know, I, I hesitate to use the word manifestation, but he, uh, if you believe in something um, hard enough, you really believe in yourself and you want something to happen, that's under your control to make things happen for yourself or for other people around you and people that you love. And uh, I think he focuses focuses his attention a lot on that when he's writing. Yeah, because I imagine if it's not, if they're not really that personal, it's hard to put the feel and the emotion into them because obviously they don't really mean anything. Absolutely. It's got to mean something. 
Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So we've been at the beginning. Your brand new album, Dealing with Demons Volume Two, came out today. Um, how excited have you guys been to to get it out there? Very. We recorded a double record at, at the exact proper time for us. You know, it's we. We did it all. I was done with my parts, I think, in November of 2018. Does finished in February of 2019. And I think it was all mixed and mastered by April or May of 2019. And we were originally going to stagger the records six months apart, year apart. There were even talks about releasing them on the same day. But we never had a solid plan we hadn't gotten to that point yet we just had ideas of what we wanted to do with it then uh covid came around and it was like well we have two records ready to go so let's release one now while we're in lockdown and give give our fans something and then let's wait to release the third or the sorry not the third the second volume (laughs) and when uh when things open up again so we waited and now that things are back up and running finally it became time to release volume two what gave you the idea to do a a double volume let's do two records at the same time well well we did record both of them at the same time but the idea desert had for a long time has always been talking about doing a, a double record it's something that he always wanted wanted to do and I don't know what made us do it at this particular time, but it just felt right. You know, a lot of these things happen with conversations just with me and him in the back of the bus while we're on tour and throwing ideas around and seeing what sticks. But at some point he came up and asked me how I'd feel about doing a double record and, you know, writing a good 20 to 25 songs. And I was yeah sure why not (laughs) let's see what happens um you know at the time it was me austin and neil writing together and we just had the greatest time being in the studio you know there's when it was the three of us there was never a single argument there was never a raised voice um very very minimal amounts of frustration going on but the frustrations were usually with ourselves and not other people You know, having a hard time getting wrist recorded properly or maybe a little bit of writer's block here and there. But that was it, you know, and it was it turned out to be one of the most fun records I've ever done. You know, we I'd finally really got to go deep with Steve Evitz, who produced and mixed it and got to feel him out as a producer. And I just love working with Steve. You know, unfortunately, he's moved to the other side of the United States now, but he used to be, his studio is half hour, 45 minutes away from me. And so it was very easy to get to his studio. And he's, his work ethic is stellar. You know, he, we get to the studio, we spend about an hour making coffee and talking about what we're, you know, what we're going to do that day. We get to work hour for lunch, get back to work and record until we just are so tired that we can't (laughs) even hear, hear things correctly anymore. (laughs) That's when, you know, it's time to throw in the towel. When you, you get to a point where you're in the studio, we're like, is that in tune? I can't tell if that's in tune or not. And you're like, I think it's time to stop. And then the next day you go and listen to it and it's either, yeah, that was completely out of tune. We need to do that again. Or, you know, make fun of yourself because like, man, I was really hearing things yesterday. So when the ears get fatigued, it's time to throw in the towel. Then you start over again. But man, we spent a lot of time in the studio together. And it's at the end of the mixing process. He was like, I don't think I'll ever do another double record ever again, because the mixing process is was just brutal for him you know you've got 10 songs done and you're just and having that feeling of i got 10 more to go (laughs) i mean you know i i've mixed records and i think the most i've ever done on an album is 12 or 13 songs i just can't imagine adding another seven i mean it just it, it it must instill that feeling of there's just no end in sight 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we got it done. I'm very happy with the record and let's uh I I can honestly say we'll probably never do it again. Probably just well, <laughs> yeah, no volume like, one and two anymore. There's just going to be one solid record. Yeah. It's almost like a tick box thing. Like, we've done that. We don't need to do it again. You know, it was a, the, yeah, it was a bucket list thing for sure. Yeah. And I'm glad we did it, but I don't think we'll do it again. So, because you obviously had Outlaws to the end, volume one. So, was there meant to be a second one for that? There was an idea to do that. I don't think it'll ever happen, though. Okay. I never say never, but the urge to go and do another country covers record or any kind of covers record for that matter just doesn't uh, doesn't appeal to me at the moment. No, because I remember uh, I saw an interview with Desert Download Festival. I want to say it was twenty sixteen, somewhere around that time when he was getting interviewed um, on Download TV, and he mentioned the country record. Um, mm-hmm. And he worked with Johnny Cash's, I want to say, wife or sister? Well, he worked with uh, uh, Johnny Cash's son and his son. wife. Yeah, John yes, Cash that Jr. Was and his wife on um, uh, Ghost Riders. That must have been surreal in a way. Yeah, he did it but... at John Cash's cabin, too. He went down there. I didn't go. I was invited, but... I, I had other obligations, and I I definitely just could not make it happen. Unfortunately, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, it is. But uh, I'm really happy with the way that song came out, and I'm glad that uh, it's a pretty cool thing to have Johnny Cash's kid and wife to be a part of it. Yep, that's that's quite a again. That's another tick. Thank you very much. Bucket list thing achieved. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. But you released uh, through the depths. Uh, if blood is life and the relationship broken, the singles were they were they well received? So far, very very well. And uh, yeah, I was. It came to a shock that I had saw a lot of comments when we were released through the depths that we had uh, integrated some black metal vibe into our music, and I was like, well, I never really saw it that way, but I'll take it, sure. <laughs> But well, well, overall, well, the know. the response has been very positive. I'm I'm very pleased. Well, those three tracks apps were three of the ones that I picked out that I thought were just apps would just blew me away. Uh, along with summoning, yeah, that's it's, probably my favorite song on the record. Yeah, it, I was just like, oh my god, this is unbelief. I'm strapping myself in because this is incredible. This is gonna be a ride. <laughs> um, but what do you feel sets this album apart from the other nine? Well, um, let's see. Granted, it was a, obviously a double. Yeah, uh, different different ingredients in the recipe for for this one. You know, being having Neil and Austin involved heavily in the writing process. You know, when you get different people in the band that are writing, you know, you're gonna get a different vibe and, uh. When, when we were doing Trust No One, I started that record on my own before we had even hired Neil and Austin. And it was a very weird time for me not having Berklin and Jeff and Miller around. Um, you know, I was... I saw it coming. And it made me sad. And I was literally, you know, I, was, I built... This is where we do a lot of the writing now in the studio. And I was literally up against a wall... And I just started and I kind of looked around and I was like, you know, I'm going to build this whole studio. We're going to have a cooler vibe to write in better, you know, recordings, just better everything. And I remember thinking to myself, they're all probably going to fucking quit. And (laughs) sure enough, you know, Berkland came down here once right when I finished building the studio because it took me about a year and a half to finish. And I uh, we worked on one song together. And shortly after that, he decided to throw in the towel as well. You know, Miller had already been gone and uh, Berklin and Kendrick decided to quit. And I was like, well, I guess I got to start this on my own, if not do the whole damn record on my own with just me and Dez. But uh, luckily we found Austin and Neil and 
our chemistry just, just we, we vibed right away. And, but we had just met each other when we did Trust No One. And then we did a covers record, which is a much different thing than throwing together a record uh, full of originals. And so by the time that we got to writing for Dealing With Demons, we had worked on two records together. We had done a lot of touring together and we had become much better friends over that time. So by the time we got to Dealing With Demons, we were very comfortable with one another. We knew everybody's strengths and weaknesses. You know, I have strengths and weaknesses that are basically um, balanced out by Neil. You know, like he is just Neil's just a better lead player than I am. You know, he it'll take me a week to to write a solo until I'm happy with it, where it literally will take him about 10 minutes. And so, oh. you know, there's and a good example of that is the solo on You Give Me a Reason to Drink from volume one. You know, I. I didn't even attempt to write a solo for that. You know, after I finished writing the song, I was like, I just knew that his style would um, lead to better results on for a solo on that one. And you know, I just hit record in my studio one day and I'm just, just come up with something out of nowhere. And he did. And it changed a little bit when he did the final recording with Steve. But I would say it was like 90 percent there. And it literally took him five minutes. That's nuts. The people that can just do that, they literally just give them a sound and they go, oh, awesome, cheers. They're away. Like, wait, hang on, what? what yeah. What did you and just play? then, do it again. Uh, yeah, it's, he's just that type of lead player. And I, I swear to God, it has to do with, it might have something to do with the fact that he's left handed, but he plays right handed. So his, his dominant hand is on the neck. Oh, yeah, of course. Where my dominant hand is plucking the strings. And that's, you know, I that's I, I feel kind of where I do a little bit better than some players is the right hand stuff. You know, when I was in college, I was in this black and death metal band and that a, a progressive black and death metal band. And we had like we had songs that were 15 minutes long and it was just, you know, tremolo picking for, for almost through the whole thing. And I developed a very good right hand at, with my time in that band. And, um, but I like writing solos, but it just does not come as easy to me as it does some other people. You know, I can get there and, but I revise, rewrite, and I'll change things over the course of at least a week until I'm at a point where I'm like, okay, <laughs> I got it. <laughs> But in a way, that's a good thing because surely that means it just gets better every time. Sometimes, <laughs> but uh, sometimes I also need someone. I, I like collaborating with people, but sometimes I need someone like Neil or Austin, or you know, in the future for the next ra record, which will be Davir, Alex, and and Miller. But I don't know when to stop. Sometimes you know, some it'd be. And I like to have someone there to tell me when something is good or not, or if I should make it better. And a lot of times I think I throw away a lot of stuff that would have suited the song or the record very well, but for some reason it just doesn't work for me or I don't have that, uh, um, that person in the background going, no, Mike, that's good. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just just, le just leave it. And um, Austin and Neil were, we're very good at that, uh, having them around because you need to have other people in your band that you're writing with, with opinions that you, that you trust and will accept without getting offended or just having that person there where it's just like, you just don't respect their input whatsoever. You know, that just doesn't work. But Austin and Neil, I really respected their opinions and it was a lot of fun. I had so much fun working on these albums. No, it's good because obviously there's, there's so much is like you can just overdo it, can't you? If they get to a point where it's like you get it to a point where it's perfect, being like, oh, I don't know quite know about this part here. I might change that and that. So it's always good to have somebody else go, no, 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 you're good. You're good. Honestly, don't touch that anymore. That's exactly what happens with me. <laughs> so it's, it's always it's always good to have someone in your corner watching you and giving you some input. So. 
you know, you could waste a lot of time just rewriting stuff until you think it's good, even though the last 10 ideas you came up with were awesome. <laughs> I mean, picking a set list for you guys now for touring must be horrific with how many tracks you've got. It can be. It used to be really easy when you only have two or three records out, but now then 10 or 11 records, it's kind of hard to yeah. will, it, will it down to um a set list where you're playing enough new stuff to keep people interested but also playing you know other songs that you might be considered the hits with with the fans to uh so they don't walk out of the show going ah oh, they didn't play this they didn't play that and which when you get to this point where you have so many songs that's kind of inevitable yeah absolutely do you have like a do you change it up for like festivals though do you go you have a set list for tour and a set list for festivals or is it just pretty much the same usually kind of do it the day of or the day before you know we when we're doing festival runs we have a tendency to um but you know you got to figure out how long your your allotted set is and um that's always been my job is to you know i'll go into itunes and be like okay this is going to be our headlining set and I'll time out the songs and kind of get a rough idea of where the breaks are, um, where Des is going to talk, where we're going to tune, where we're going to switch guitars, uh, take a beer break. Yeah, and <laughs> important. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, from day to day, you'll find out, okay, well, we got 40 minutes to play today. We got 35 minutes to play tomorrow. We got 45 minutes or we have an hour and I'll just kind of go through the set list and, and make changes to make sure that we don't go over because going over your set time at a festival is a very bad thing. Not only do you piss off the, uh, the people in charge, the crew and the workers, but you also uh, run a risk of really pissing off another band and cutting into their set time, which is something you don't want to do. We've had it happen to us. And it can be infuriating. Yeah, I can't even begin to imagine. Obviously, I have no clue. But um, because you were meant to obviously be playing Bloodstock this year. um, And I was very excited to be seeing you guys. Clearly, I totally understand why you had to drop out for obvious reasons. Um, But I bet bet you guys are are gutted you're not coming over here. I am. It's been a very long time since we've been to Europe. But I'm hoping that 2024 we'll we'll get some festivals under our belt and it won't be just one you know flying over we have done that before back in the day we did fly all the way to wales for one festival and flew home the very next day what what festival Mm -hmm. was that i don't remember what the name of the festival was but five finger death punch was headlining and they were it was around the time where they didn't become the band that they are now but they were they were getting there so they weren't yeah. quite as big as they are now but um you know kind of give you a, a reference of what what uh what year it was but honestly i have no idea what the name of that festival was i just know it was in wales that's cr- I live there. I live in Wales, so I was just that's why I was oh, curious. Okay. <laughs> uh, you'll have to come back here at some point, though. But I cannot imagine, obviously, being on the west coast, so you're like eight, nine hours behind to fly all the way here for one day to fly all the way back must have absolutely destroyed you. Yeah, it was interesting. I think I spent more time on a plane than I did on the ground in in Europe. That's crazy, man. But. Yeah. Yeah, we're really, really hoping that obviously you guys can come over here next year. It'd be great to have you back over here again. Um, I know you mentioned the tour at the beginning. Uh, we were talking about the Cradle of Filth tour. Yeah, that you did it just did in March, the co-headliner. Yes. Yeah. How uh, obviously we've gone into a bit of detail, but how was it overall? So much fun. Yeah. You know, I think we were all so grateful to be back out on the road, and you know, Alex and Davier, they were just stoked to be back in a band, and because. <laughs> Alex hasn't really been doing much with Holy Grail um, in the last few years. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is we hired Alex, God, I would say well over a year ago. And it's like, yeah, you're on the band, but we have no idea when we're going to need you because (laughs) we're just we're waiting to figure things out. But, you know, I really enjoy Davier's company. I miss the hell out of Miller. 
and uh, I really enjoy hanging out now with all the guys in my band. And it was smooth. Cradle is very easy to tour with. Um, the opening bands, Oni and Black Satellite, were very, very sweet people. And it was just fun. You know, it's it was easy. You know, I enjoyed being in my bunk again. I enjoyed being around my friends. I enjoyed playing all the shows and, you know, having our tour manager out, Eddie Ortel, you know, who has been with the band since day, you know, he and I started working for Devil Driver on the same day, you know, and so he, uh, Eddie's been kind of a mentor to me and to, you know, teaching me the, the ups and downs and how to, conduct yourself properly on tour and he came back out on this tour and was doing sound and and tour managing us and it's just it's nice to have the family back together again especially you know with me miller eddie and des i mean we just go way back we've been doing this a long time that's like there's no signs of stopping it's like it what was that they said there's no signs of stopping, and I take it either. No, 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 no. We're we we still got plenty of juice left in us. Lovely, that's what we like to hear. Um, so how does the rest of the year look then? Is there any shows coming up at all, or is it just? We're in the works of putting together another leg in the states with with Cradle of Filth, and I believe that tour is going to start in October and go into November, but. Uh, the dates haven't been 100% solidified yet, but we should be announcing that very soon. Awesome. And then hopefully over here for next year. Yes. And there are talks of Australia and Japan uh, early next year. And I would love to go back to Australia and Japan. Uh, I I love those countries as well as Europe. I'm kind of, I'd like to get away from the United States for a little while. I used to enjoy touring the States the most, but for some reason over the years, I think I've kind of gravitated toward, I uh, enjoying touring Europe a little bit more than touring the States. Everywhere in the States looks the same, you know? Uh, Europe has much more eye candy as far as architecture uh, and just a history that goes back so much further than it does in the United States. And... I would just like to change it up a little bit. Yeah. Know, just kind of different countries have different vibes, different food, different people, different bars, <laughs> different coffee houses, <laughs> and just all those little things that I love about being in away from home. Um, I'm ready to mix it up and get back over there again. Yeah, well, we're very excited to have you. We'll have to see when Des recovers and gets back to 100%. Again, it'd be great to have you over here. Um, one final question, Mike, before I let you get on and let you get out of here. Music videos obviously were massive back. In, they obviously are still sort of big now, but obviously they were huge. Like you mentioned MTV in the eighties and stuff in the nineties and everything. But with with making music videos, love them or hate them. Uh, it's funny you bring that up because I was just expressing to some people how. I used to love music videos. These days, I think a lot of people are running out of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> and every now and then a band comes out with a video that I really, really love and makes me go, okay, they really put some time into this, really trying to be coming up with more of an original idea. And the one that always I always kind of go back to is the first video released by Allison Chains when they released uh, Black Is Way to Blue. Um, it's a song called uh, Looking in View. And we were actually in El Paso, I think working on, yeah, we were working on Beast when that album, when that song dropped. And I'm a massive Allison Chains fan. I never got to see him live with Lane. And, but Jerry Contrell is my favorite guitar player. I, I just love everything that that guy does. And when I remember sitting at my laptop in in the room where I was working on music for the record and uh, went and watched that video. And I was like, oh, finally, they not only was the song incredibly awesome, which usually is not the case when a band replaces their lead vocalist, especially someone like Lane, 
who is got some very big shoes to fill in, but I think yep. William did a fantastic job. And I think, you know, Jerry did an awesome job bringing the Allison chains vibe back to life with that record. And, um, that's one of the videos that I thought was, was very cool, but a lot of videos these days, unfortunately don't really do it for me. I like, I, I think people really need to sit down and, start to think about um the more original ideas for their music but uh you know music videos are tough a lot of people don't have the budgets that they used to yeah. you know like i remember talking with life of agony when we were on tour with them we were doing off dates with them in europe and I was talking to uh, the drummer and the guitarist in the dressing room one day, and they were telling, you know, when they first got signed to a major label back in the 90s, I think it was. Um, I forget which label it was, but I think they told me that the record label had a lot of them, I think, $250,000 to do a, a video. And their response was, we don't, because any money they give you, you got to pay back through record sales until you start seeing royalties coming in and there were no we don't need this much <laughs> this much money for a record but the record label was like no 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 you have to use this money for your video and i can't i don't know, know if they really did in the long run or not i don't know what song it was for i might not even be 100 percent on the amount but i know it was well over 100 100 grand and I just I just couldn't believe that, you know. It's oh. here's a band saying no, we don't need this much money to film a video with a record label, basically forcing the money down their throat, and also on top of that, forcing them to pay it back through record record sales. Which, you know, God, if Devil Driver had a budget like that, I'm sure we could make the coolest video on earth, as <laughs> as with a lot of other bands. But you know, the budgets just aren't what they used to be. So, um. I think people a lot of times go for uh, the simple route. And I have noticed that bands don't seem to be doing lyric videos as much as they used to. Now, I think people are starting to gravitate away from that, or at least I just haven't noticed them. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, lyric videos, some of them are really cool, but I think that's that was kind of a fad that's died out. A little bit yeah i mean i know youtube is obviously a massive thing now so i think people put like snippets just on tiktok or whatever and put like you know like little minute videos up so you get that but it's just like of the song playing and like a picture i guess i think maybe that's what it's come to now <laughs> yeah i think so mike this has been absolutely amazing thank you so much for taking time of your morning to sit and chat to me are there any plugs social medias anything you want people to go and check out well uh album comes out today go get yourself a vinyl go listen go to spotify go give the record a listen apple music whatever whatever you fancy and uh for those that you listen in the states we got another tour hopefully coming up in october through november uh maybe a little bit of japan and australia 2024 hopefully a festival run coming in 2024 throughout europe We'll see. And uh, we've already begun writing on the next record with an old school member who was a big part of writing back in the day, John Miller. And uh, so get excited. The The next record is going to be is going to be special. Oh, my days. Unbelievable. Mike, mate, thank you. Much. Thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate your time um, dealing with Demons Volume 2 up now. So make sure you go check it out. Go stream it and play it to a 15,000, not even 11. Get it right up. <laughs> Take care of yourself, my friend. Have a wonderful day. And uh, I look forward to seeing you over here soon. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. Make sure you keep up to date with future episodes by subscribing to our channels. For more information on this podcast, or for all the latest music news, reviews, interviews, and more, head over to our website, www.theraziseedge.rocks.